Good afternoon. We're resuming in public session. Um, first, first and foremost, good afternoon. Um, two, two notices, housekeeping. First and foremost, with the mobile phones, either switch them off or to flight mode. It's not just for the meeting, it's for the recording and broadcast. And secondly, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of, the evidence, of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name, or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. The opening statements uh, that you've submitted to the committee will be published on the committee website after the meeting. And finally, members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official, either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I'm pleased at this stage this afternoon to welcome Focus Ireland, represented by Mr Ashley Balburney and Mr Mike Allen. As I said at the outset, your uh, submissions have been uh, circulated um, and they'll be published on the website afterwards. So at this stage, I would ask you if you'd like to make an opening presentation and then I'll ask colleagues uh, to have a number of questions for you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I am Ashley Balburney. I'm Chief Executive of Focus Ireland. I've been in office for just over a year now. My colleague, our Director of Advocacy, Mike Allen, will probably be much more familiar to a number of you here. Um, I'd like to start by, by thanking the Oireachtas Committee for the invitation to make a direct presentation to you on the housing and homelessness crisis that confronts us. I want to take this opportunity to commend you on your work to date the range of submissions you have heard and the close and detailed questioning around the key issues. Focus Ireland has long called for homelessness to be treated as a political priority and the hard work and diligence of this committee is a practical expression of what being treated as a political priority looks like. The work of the committee has been given added significance by the publication of the programme for government which includes the commitment to produce an action plan for housing with 100, within 100 days of the government being formed. We welcome this and also the commitment to arrive at the plan through a collaborative process. We see this meeting as an important element in that collaboration. Focus Ireland has made a comprehensive submission to the committee which com covers a number of the issues which need to be addressed. As we note in the submission, a comprehensive strategy designed to bring an end to homelessness would include a wider range of, support of measures related to general, general poverty, mental health, the justice system and support for young people who grew up in care. We do not want these issues to be forgotten, but we consider the approach of the committee to be reasonable in the present circumstances, that is to concentrate on the immediate crisis which confronts us and is driven primarily by a severe shortage of affordable housing. Focus Ireland, formed over 30 years ago uh, by Sister Stan, is one of the leading or homeless homeless organisations in Ireland with a presence in most parts uh, of the country. We run a range of services from providing long-term homes for people who need ongoing support through tenancy and sustainment, training and advice and information. The core of our work is in the areas of preventing homelessness and supporting people to exit homeless, homelessness. And while we work with anyone who is homeless or at risk of homelessness, we have a particularly recognised expertise in the areas of family, young people and housing first. We are the designated housing action team for the homeless, for the homeless families in the four Dublin local authority areas. And on behalf of DRHE, we provide case management support to families across the city. Our submission is based on the frontline experience of our staff across the country, supporting over 12,500 people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness during the last year. While we are more than happy to take any questions arising from any aspect of our submission or indeed any other dimension of our work or advocacy, which is of interest to the committee. We want to use our time here, if we may, to concentrate on one aspect in particular, and we thought our time would be best spent uh, by doing that. Well, obviously, bearing in mind you've heard many submissions and you've covered m many aspects of this issue already. The area we'd like to concentrate on is the importance of preventing homelessness and preventing family homelessness in particular. 
We want to concentrate on pre prevention because if we don't do something to slow down the flow of families into, into homelessness, the system will move from crisis point to breaking point and huge damage will be done to many lives while we wait for the longer term solutions to kick in. The numbers are stark and within my opening remarks which you've received copies of there's two tables and I might just refer you to those two tables uh, for a second. In terms of the official figures for families who are accommodated in emergency accommodation nationally, no other official figures are available prior to June 2014, but from other work that Focus Ireland undertook at the time, we estimate that a total of around 150 families were homeless in February 2013. And you can see the move in those figures uh, since then, with the first official figures showing 291 families in June of 2014, moving through last year, figures rising all the time, to now over 1,000 families, and crucially over 2,000 dependents' children uh, in homelessness. As I say, I joined just over a year ago. Shortly after I joined, uh, the number uh, of children uh, topped over 1,000, and there was a significant uh, commotion, media interest in, in it uh, at that time, the fact that it had sort of magically passed this figure uh, of, of 1,000, and the ISPCC, Children's Rights Alliance, or, or others, uh, were, were rightly extremely vocal uh, on the subject. Well, again, just to, to stress, we've now passed it twice that number, or, or over 2,000, and comparatively, I would say hardly a, uh, hardly a murmur, uh, even though th those figures uh, have doubled in, in just uh, over a year. Um, truly scary, uh, we believe. In terms of the second uh, table, uh, the growth uh, of uh, newly, fa newly homeless families in Dublin over a slightly longer period, going back to the start of 2013, Crucially, the point we would make out of there, a doubling of those figures, an average 15 families 2013, 34 2014, 62 2015, and 92 just uh, on the limited year to date. Again, the crucial question we would ask is, what is fundamentally changing that's going to stop that continuing? because we're struggling enough, we and others involved in this area, the area of the DRHE, we are struggling so hard to contain the numbers as they stand at the moment. Um, we're all really having difficulty seeing how we can cope with those in increased uh, figures. There is a temptation, obviously, uh, very understandably, to focus on the emergency side of things in, in the short term. Members of the committee will be familiar with our criticisms of the quality of some of this emergency accommodations, the long distance from schools, the absence of cooking, washing facilities, etc. These are extremely important criticism, criticisms and much needs to be done to ensure consistently acceptable quality of emergency accommodation. However, it is also important to recognise the achievement of the Dublin Regional Homeless Executive in rapidly scaling up its provision for homeless families and responding to a crisis that was once unpredicted uh, by official sources, which grew then at an unprecedented level and is caused by factors largely beyond its control. Again, I refer you back to the families. You're effectively looking at organisations like the DRHE, ourselves, Peter McFerry, others involved in the area. We're trying to make plans, we're trying to make budgets about the figures of one year and we're dealing with effectively double the figures uh, the next year. Um, I'm not sure in what context uh, that that is possible to do. Uh, we want to clearly signal to the committee our view that there comes a time when the problem reaches the scale when you simply run out of available hotel rooms and B&Bs. We believe that we are approaching that point. We do not believe that there are any proposals to provide a significant number of new homes which will bear fruit in the next six to eight months, and that at the current rate of growth, the current provision will suffice. Will suffice. There is nothing to indicate that. We need to either start providing a very different sort of emergency accommodation well below what is considered acceptable now, which is clearly not an option, or else start getting very much better at preventing people from losing their homes. You will have heard earlier this week about the situations where a number of families had to be accommodated on blow-up beds in offices or accommodation for single adults because it was past midnight and no emergency bed could be found for them. We are running out of language to describe the situation. If a hotel room is emergency accommodation, what do we call a room in an adult hostel we use when the emergency accommodation has run out? And what do we call the office we use when the beyond emergency rooms have run out? 
We tend to call them a place of safety. That cold technical title does not convey the anxiety and fear that children must feel late at night when they finally are offered such a place. But perhaps it does make clear the level of risk which exists if we ever reach a night in which we have run out of places of safety. That's why we want the concentration, and if I left no other message personally with this committee today, it would be that one, that we have to address the prevention issue. We have to stop the flow into homelessness in some shape or form. Otherwise, we're just going to keep throwing more money at bigger and bigger numbers to try to, try to turn back a tide which, which must be got at its source. Um, to give you a little bit more detail, if I might pass over to my colleague, Mike Allen, who, who will now outline some of the specific measures, not all of them you'll be pleased to hear that we outline in the submission, but again picking out some of them which might be uh, of uh, relevance and note for, for this committee. Mr. Thank Adam. you. Thank you. Um, Yes, I want to concentrate on a few areas around prevention and maybe a couple of other points. We're concentrating a lot on an area, the area that we have got the highest level of direct experience, which is about the, the family, homelessness, family homelessness issue as a, the lead organisation in that area. And it's important to, to realise that the families who are entering homeless services are almost entirely had their last homes in the private rented sector. So there is a very considerable concern about owner-occupiers and the problems they are in the mortgage arrears and so on. But virtually none of those families have ended up in homeless services. They may be homeless in more general senses in some cases, but uh, virtually none of them have ever come to homeless services. That should be seen not as a cause of uh, complacency, but as one of the areas where if, if the purpose of public policy over the last number of years in relation to owner occupiers in arrears is to prevent those families becoming homeless it is actually an outstanding success so that's something we should just leave it as it is but i think it's worth noting and looking at some of the things that that, that, that led into achieving that not to say that there aren't still huge problems there in, in in that sector about indebtedness and stress on the families but it actually isn't formal homelessness so looking at the private rented sector and this is where the families are, are essentially are, are coming from. The two factors which are driving them out are the increase in rent levels and evictions of one sort or another. And unless we're able to tackle those two issues, we're going to see this continued increase of families being pushed out of the private rented sector into, into homeless services. And on rent levels, essentially there are two things you can do. One is to do something to moderate the increase in rent, uh, rent levels themselves through some form of rent certainty or rent moderation legislation. We always advocated that that should be done either in the short term or long term by linking rents to CPI. The last government or some elements in the last government tried to achieve that and the government used a different mechanism which predictably didn't have the effect that was, that was required uh, because the political will right across government didn't exist. And so political will is a crucial question in how these things are dealt with. Uh, the other uh, way of dealing with the issue is to increase the amount of money in the pockets of the people who are being forced out. And virtually every one of the families that become homeless, the last time that they lived in private rented accommodation, they were receiving rent supplement. So there is no escaping the fact that the inadequacy of rent supplement levels is a driving force for pushing families into homelessness. That said, we don't believe any of these is a, are, are simple solutions. There isn't sort of a, a, a simple answer to these things, and there are unintended consequences for every action that you might take. We argued several years ago that rent supplements should be increased in line with market rents. Nothing was done, and they've fallen so far behind now that for housing assistance payments under the homeless hat to get families back into accommodation, we're re regularly paying 60 70% above the rent supplement level in order to get a family back into homelessness when we aren't willing to pay them an adequate level of rent supplement uh, uh, earlier on. The, there are ways of dealing with rent supplement which go beyond the threshold intervention and so on. Because it isn't, the metaphor I would use is as if the entire roof was blown off and the rain is pouring in over the entire roof and threshold and Department of Social Protection are running around with buckets trying to say, is anybody getting wet? We'll put a bucket there. That is not the 
you know, so you can see it's successful. You can say that rent supplement measure of thresholds is, is successful because the number of people is prevented from becoming homeless. But you also have to look at the fact that every month since it was introduced, the number of families becoming homeless has continued to rise. The, set, the, the further area of how people are losing their accommodation is through evictions. And we would very strongly argue an improvement in tenants' rights in that area, and particularly the issues that arise when the landlord has to, is a, the, the current loophole almost that the ten, tenants' tenancy can be ended if the landlord wants to sell the property, and legislation could be used to fix that up. And a final area in that, in that particular area is in terms of policing of, the, of uh, the rules that exist. So currently, if a family becomes homeless because their landlord says he is selling his property or his niece is moving in or whatever, they go to the local authority and the local authority assesses them as homeless and they give that as the reason. But nobody from the local authority goes down to 24 Sycamore Crescent and finds out whether that's actually true. So the le you have passed all this legislation creating all this protection, but nobody polices it. It's left to the family that's been made homeless and have got other things in their mind to raise it as an issue. It's a simple measure it, to simply have a trigger there that somebody would go out and check it and do a report. Yes, it is being sold. We'll actually know it's for let again and trigger the legislation. Um, we put forward a proposal. Uh, there's a lot of things that need to be done here which are not very attractive because of the crisis we're in. And one of the proposals we put in, which we draw to your attention, is a number of the families, after they lose their, their secure home, uh, go and live with wider family for a period of time. And after that breaks down because they're overcrowded, and sometimes it breaks down because the local authority says you can't live here because it's too crowded, they go into homeless services. A proportion of those families could be supported to live in that broader family for a longer period of time, what they call doubling up in the homeless services in the state. But they'd have to hold their position on the, home, uh, on the homeless list, and they'd have to have a case manager from the Focus Island team so they don't lose out. We put that forward a few weeks ago. I know the political system has been busy, but we think there is some, not a huge amount, but a significant amount of strain that could be taken off the families and the systems by doing that. I just want to mention three other areas, just to name them at the moment, um, which move away directly from the prevention area. The first one is about research and evaluation. Ireland spends an enormous amount of money, an increasing amount of money, on homeless services. It spends zero money on evaluating the effectiveness of the measures. Focus Ireland spends a significant amount of the money we raise on evaluating our services, but the state spends nothing. We recently had a talk from a, a very brilliant talk from a Canadian researcher where 10% of a project was spent on the research. We aren't saying there should be 10% spent. We're not even saying there should be 1%. But if this committee, as part of its report, recommended that 0.1% of the homeless budget should be ring-fenced for research and evaluation to be carried out by the housing agency, to be, be, uh, be held by them, it would begin to make a big difference in us being able to do the things, understand the things that work and understand the things that don't work. The second issue in that area I want to mention, second out of three, is about under-26s, specifically to name them. In, in the discussions, I might have missed it, but the particular problems that under-26s under who are unemployed and not care leavers face, I'm not sure has been mentioned. They're on reduced rate social welfare payments, and essentially, if they are not able to return to the family, or haven't got a family they can return to, and they've lost their home, they are... Uh, um, undoubtedly going to remain homeless until they turn 27. And that's an outrageous situation, and we are creating the rough sleepers of the future by doing that. There are a number of measures which could be done to deal with that. And the, the final uh, point under this, 